when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and at Jerusalem, he reigned over all Israel and Judah 33 years. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and he and all the people with him set out and went from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. I'm not sure what that is, actually, <laughs> to be enthroned upon the cherubim. But they carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God. And Ahio went in front of the Ark. And there David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. May God add understanding to our hearing of these words, and may we now pray to hear a good word from my words and from the reflections of all of our hearts. Will you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of my mouth and may the meditations of all of us, may they give you joy. O oh God, you who strengthen us day by day, and you who lead us day by day into new and abundant life. Amen. Well, once in a while I decide that my email inbox needs a makeover. I had a moment like that this last week. I was looking for an email from a friend of mine, and it wasn't easy to find because I had 14,964 emails in my inbox. Peter, can you beat me? Can you beat me? Close, okay. <laughs> this isn't my work email, by the way. It's just my Hotmail account that I've had for a billion years. Do you think 14,964 emails is a lot? Maybe too many? Yeah, okay. So I, I decided to clean my inbox. I put some filters in place and I looked at what was left. The emails that I actually cared about, the emails that I actually read. Most were from friends and family. And a few were like devotionals that I get in my inbox. And then there was this. There was, hello. <laughs> It's A-OK, -okay, no worries. So then in my inbox, there was this. There was a weekly devotional uh, put out by a National Geographic photographer named DeWitt Jones. Does that name strike any bells for you? Okay. Well, somewhere along the line, I had signed up for his weekly email, and then I promptly ignored it for weeks, if not years. But as I looked at it again, I saw why I had signed up for it in the first place. DeWitt Jones traveled the world for 20 years as a photographer than for the National Geographic. How many of you grew up with National Geographic? My grandmother, I think, had all of them on like many, many bookshelves. She collected them. But somehow I missed his work in there. But anyway, he took many of the photographs, the iconic photographs for National Geographic. So at some point in his career, he decided, though, that he didn't just want to photograph what he saw. He wanted to take photographs that celebrated what's right with the world. Not just what's wrong, but what's right. So at some point I heard about DeWitt Jones, his photography, his perspective. I signed up, I even went so far to sign up for his email newsletter. And then it got lost in my inbox. Lost in a sea of like lands and coupons. How about that? I literally lost a reminder to celebrate what's right about the world. And I know I'm not the only one. Can I hear an amen? 
Now, there's a lot that you can say about King David. There's a lot you should say about King David if you're going to preach on him. He sort of towers over the Old Testament like no one else does. His gifts and his flaws are larger than life. Because the book of Psalms is attributed to him, his influence over Judaism, over Christianity, over the Western world itself is just epic. And we don't actually know that he existed in real life. We don't have enough archaeological evidence for, hit for that, but I'm not really sure that matters. Because if David didn't exist, you'd have to invent him. I think if he didn't exist, you'd have to invent him. I mean, who else can beat the giant Goliath with a slingshot? And who else would dance around the ark with lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals? And who else would make his epic mistakes? Like his relationship with Bathsheba, with Bathsheba, which now, after Me Too, looks a little bit different, right? Or the fact that he murdered Bathsheba's husband to get him out of the way. From David's rise to an eager shepherd boy to his descent as sort of a King Lear type, David never does anything small. He goes big or he goes home. His sins and his successes are always epic. And that's why I love this moment in David's life, which is far more fragile than it seems. David <laughs> has just defeated Goliath as the Lord God commanded him, and now he's ready to take the symbol of God's presence on earth, the Ark of the Covenant, to Jerusalem. Someone said that you have to watch the Indiana Jones movie to fully appreciate this text. I'm not sure, but you can watch it if you want, it, if you want to. But <laughs> I wanted to say that Jerusalem then as it does now, sits at a crossroads. And in those days, it sat between the crossroads of the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And David is poised to, to take over as the ruler of them all. It looks like he just needs to simply move the Ark of the Covenant from one place to another, but that's not the way it works because you don't just put the Ark of the Covenant in your carry-on bag and hope for the best. <laughs> this road tip trip is dangerous and it needs to be handled with care and they're not going to handle it with care but you can read about that on your own but in the midst of this dicey road trip David does actually something right he celebrates he dances and not just him everyone who is with him the whole house of Israel is how the text puts it and you have to imagine this scene you have to imagine that it's noisy and raucous. Maybe the bagpipes are playing, right? And you can't hear yourself think. And in the center of this maelstrom is David, and he's dancing. He's not doing the two-step or the polka or freestyling it awkwardly. It's more like he's a whirling dervish. Do you know what I mean when I say a whirling dervish? Have you ever seen, who's seen whirling dervishes? It's incredible. Somehow they find ways to dance where they don't get dizzy. It's just incredible. And I think I read that they put their right hand like this to God, and they put their left hand like this to connect them to the earth, and then they spin around and around. It's incredible. So maybe David is doing some Near Eastern version of that. That's what David gets right in a really big way. The presence of God is going to Jerusalem. It's a new day, so please do not be polite about that, right? Don't pretend it's not a big deal. Don't act like you've seen it before. Danced like you've never danced in your whole life. Celebrate when you can and every time that you can. The cool kids are going to miss out on the best part of David. Because there's no room for irony. When things are going right, we have to celebrate. When God's presence is in front of you, you got to dance. You got to dance. 
Today, I almost showed you a clip of one of those flash mobs. Have you ever, do you know what a flash mob, it's sort of like an internet thing, but it's taken off where it's a, it's a planned event, but in this public space, suddenly people start dancing. And it's really joyful. And you can watch the people around the edges for the first couple of minutes, and they look utterly confused. <laughs> they don't know what's going on. But suddenly everyone kind of gets into the joy joyfulness. And that's something closer to what this is. It's joyful and raucous. We have a choice not to celebrate. But I think it's the wrong choice. In this day and age, with the challenges that we're facing, I don't think celebration is optional anymore. I think it's necessary. I know, I know, I am not the only one who loses the invitation to celebrate in her inbox. I know I'm not the only one who can barely stand to read the news. I know I'm not the only one who is more than a little freaked out about the literal state of the planet. I know I'm not the only one whose mind gets trapped in negativity. How many of you are willing to admit that? But you know what? That's why I come here. That's why I come here. I know what's wrong. <laughs> I can, I'm sure I only know the half of it, but I know what's wrong. But I come here to remember what is right. What's right. I come here to learn how to see what's right. I come here to celebrate God's presence, which more often than not is right in front of me. I come here because I know I'm not dancing nearly enough. Where are those castanets? Where are they? I think every day... And every moment of every day, we have a very basic decision to make. And I can almost, if I slow myself down enough, I can tell. Almost in a moment, we can choose to celebrate or despair, right? We can choose to love or fear. We can choose to celebrate what's right or to obsess over what's wrong. And sometimes if I slow myself down enough, I can tell, oh, I'm afraid here. Right here in this moment, I'm acting out of fear. So I put this to myself, and I put this to you because in the end, a sermon is just a sermon. It's just words in the air until they land somewhere. So are you celebrating enough? Are you taking intentional time every single day to look for what's right? To say thank you for what's right? To ask for more of what is right? Or is your inbox full of coupons and missed opportunities? I like to imagine that the whole house of Israel danced like no one was watching. Because no one was watching. <laughs> no one was standing at the edge of the flash mob looking in. Every single person was dancing. The whole house saw David spinning around like a joyful fool and thought, you know what, <laughs> that makes sense to me. And then one person after another decided to join in. And then everyone was dancing, the young and the old, the grumpy and the ecstatic. And why not? Why not? They saw David's point. The presence of God was literally in their midst. And no one wanted to be left out. May it be so for us today. Amen.